that's not the end. You can mute yourself. <laughs> it's still in progress. Okay. Got it. Hi everyone, in behalf of the Dharma Friend of Israel, uh, we are uh, meeting together to learn with the Chita with uh, our beloved teacher, uh, Geshe Kelsen Gwangmo. Uh, we will wait a little bit and she will uh, join us and then uh, we will start. Thank you. And if you can put your camera so that she will not see black uh, in front of her. So it will be nice. Thank you. Hi, Geshema. Hi. I just Hi. said that uh, we will start when you are coming. So I will make you co-host. Okay. Thank you. And we can start. All right. Okay. Great. <sighs> Okay, so let's start with the motivation. Oh, well, maybe one thing before we start. Uh, I'm leaving India on Thursday. No, Thursday I'm traveling to Delhi and I'm leaving India on uh, Saturday. So once I'm in Germany, we can change the time again to, well, to a little bit more, I mean, to a more normal time for you guys because uh, it's just, there's only, I think, an hour difference between Germany and India. Uh, in Israel. So please let me know what works for you best. Uh, last time I think it was six in Germany and seven in Israel or something like yeah, that. It was but six o'clock in Israel it was. It was what? Six o'clock in, in Israel. Israel. Yeah. Ah, so then it was seven in Germany. Okay. If that works well, then of course we can go back to that time. Okay. I always speak with you and we'll close it and I wouldn't announce for other people. Okay. Great. Sounds good. Okay, so let's start then, of course, with breathing meditation as usual, and then setting the right kind of motivation. And then visualize in the space in front of you the embodiment of all the amazing qualities you yourself can attain, have the potential to attain. Such as great compassion, wisdom, realizing or understanding all phenomena. So visualize that these qualities arise in the form of Buddha Shakyamuni. Who's inseparable from your Lama or your Lamas. showing us what we are capable of achieving and at the same time guiding us to reach such a state. The Buddha appears in the form of a renunciate 
that is a monk wearing the saffron colored robes. His legs in the full lotus posture. His right hand in the earth touching gesture and his left hand resting in his lap in the meditation gesture. while holding a begging bowl. And he's smiling at you and all other sentient beings with a radiant and inspiring face. And then to remind us why we're here. What is the purpose of our life? Think that you're surrounded by all sentient beings. Who are seated all around you. Appearing in the form of a human. with a mind that, in its essence, does not differ from our mind or the mind of a Buddha. But that is temporarily obstructed by ignorance and all the other afflictions causing endless problems, difficulties, and other unwanted experiences. And so based on that understanding, Try to generate affectionate love towards each and every one of them. Finding them lovable to a certain degree, especially based on their essential nature. are feeling close towards them and having a deep sense of concern and affection for them. Try to really open your heart towards these countless beings. And 
and they while paying particular attention to all their unwanted experiences. Their pain, their worries, and their lack of deep inner peace. Generate great compassion that sincerely wishes for each and every sentient being to be free from any dissatisfactory experience and its causes. As well as the deep aspiration to be able to protect them from all dissatisfactory experiences and most importantly, their causes. And then allow that great compassion to intensify. And to give way to the special altruistic attitude that is determined to take personal responsibility in the sense of being determined to dedicate our time and even our entire life towards benefiting sentient beings in particular towards working to free sentient beings from all sufferings and their causes. And since that is only really possible once we become enlightened, once we attain the omniscient state of Buddhahood, let's generate the mind of enlightenment, the, the sincere aspiration to become fully enlightened, to be able to help sentient beings overcome their sufferings and their causes. And it's also with this mind of enlightenment that we continue to study text on mind training. And so to deepen our motivation, let's first take refuge to recite the prayer of free, taking refuge in bodhicitta by focusing on the meaning of each word. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha, 
to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. Okay. Just a sec, so I'll share the Lamrim text with you. Okay, can you see the Lamrim? Yeah, great. Okay, so we're still working on this particular meditation. We're still going through this. Um, I'll complete it today, but to say a few more words about it because it's so important. This meditation is just, well, it's central to the meditation on bodhicitta. There are two methods, as you all know, uh, two methods for generating the mind of enlightenment, but usually they should be practiced. They should be practiced in, in a combination, like together. I mean, not exactly simultaneously because you can't meditate on one while meditating on the other at the same time, but still to not neglect one over the other. Now, as we've heard before, uh, here, equalizing and exchanging self for others. Well, whereas it's also described here, it consists of a few points. And so one point I made before, I mean, we're all aware of that, that of course we suffer from what's called self-centeredness based on our misperception, of course, but also, well, besides that, and, and despite the fact that actually to overcome self-centeredness, we need to uh, eradicate ignorance, but even without doing so, we can significantly reduce our self-centeredness, uh, despite not having realized, even without having realized emptiness. So until we've come to realize the ultimate nature of all phenomena, well, it's important to work on that self-centeredness, to recognize it within ourselves, to recognize its influence, it recognize its power over our mind, to work with it, to not suppress it, but at the same time to not allow for it to grow, uh, well, first of all, to, to go wild in our mind and not allow for it to take over in every situation, and of course to make sure that it doesn't grow stronger. And instead, of course, to reduce it as much as we can. So to think of all the disadvantages of that mind, that this is truly responsible for the fact that we cannot experience sincere or ultimate inner peace, like real inner peace. Of course, there are times when we feel peaceful internally. We have an in inner kind of sense of peace and satisfaction, but that's not long lived. And there's always a sense of something could happen to I, me, and mine. There's always a sense of foreboding. Um, and of course, there are worse problems than that. Um, a lot of suffering comes from exactly that mind. So, so to recognize that and to recognize, of course, the importance of cherishing others. But one point that may be important to, to make is that, of course, we innately feel, well, I have to be self-centered. I have to look after myself. I have to put myself first because who else is going to look after myself? So there's this innate sense, this is me, I'm over here. And if I, my mind and my body doesn't care, take care of myself, well, I'm going to be in deep trouble. So we identify very strongly with this mind and with this body. That is our mind, of course, itself. It very much identifies with this mind and body. Well, this mind is, of course, identical with itself. So there's no surprise there, but it's also with this body. 
considering our body to be more important than that of others. But it's very interesting that it's very interesting that on a psychological on a psychological basis, well, our self cherishing this body actually, well, when we were when we were um, what's the word conceived at the time of conception. So the way it is explained in the scriptures is that our mind came from a previous existence. And then when the life, our previous life was ended, our mind, of course, continued on. There's no end to the continuum of awareness. So in, in the case of our own awareness, it continued on. And due to our comic connection with our parents, with our present parents, at the time of um, the the well, the union, if you like, the coming together of our um, uh, father's semen and the mother's uh, fertilized egg, or father's the mother's ovum and father's semen. So when the at the time of the of the fertilized uh, egg of the mother of ovum of the mother, at that time our consciousness entered that physical basis, and from then onwards, there's this connection there. But there was also the mind very much. Um, habituating itself this is my body this is my body so initially of course that wasn't th that process didn't take place i mean first of course the the body needed to grow the the cells the cell needed to divide and so forth until there was a body with nerves and so forth and as this, the the body grew the stronger was the sense my body my body even without words because at that time we didn't uh, we weren't able to speak we were as, as embryos, as fetuses in our mother's womb. But it's through this habituation over many, many, well, months and then years, the sense this is my body. And therefore, any kind of sensation in the body is seen as my sensation, my this, my that. But there have been some interesting experiments um, on how we can actually also identify with a different body. So I've, I usually give the same example. I should find some new new examples, really. But um, this is, I find, a, a very potent kind of example. It's about this experiment that was done with people who were wearing these virtual reality glasses, like, yeah, you know, I think you've all seen them. Like you wear like uh, this, this kind of almost like a screen before your eyes, and you, you have this this experience of a different different uh, environment or the certain situation. So, in this case, like the 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 the, the, the research objects, they were wearing these glasses or these I don't know what you call them, the, these screens, uh, virtual virtual reality screens of for lack of a better word. So anyway, they were wearing these. And when they looked down on themselves, they actually saw a dummy. So it was not their body, but it was the body of a dummy. And the dummy was standing in that same room, but they couldn't see that it was somewhere else. They only looked like looking down on themselves. They saw this body of a dummy. And the mind automatically identifies with this body of the dummy. So there was this psychological process. They stayed with it for some time, looking down in themselves. And I don't know exactly. There was some movement. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly how it went. But they gave each person who was part of the experience, they gave them time for their mind to make that connection. My body. Looking down in themselves, my body. Uh, so I don't know whether there was movement involved. I mean, well, the dummy obviously wasn't moving, but maybe they there was some kind of computerized uh, effect. I don't know. But the point was they had some time to customize to get used to this. And then someone took a feather and touched parts of the body. And many of the people who who, who were part of the experiments felt the feather felt that feather on their on their arms or wherever the dummy was touched so it wasn't actually their body wasn't touched but because they had now identified with the body of the dummy they felt very strongly that they had been touched so there some reported an actual physical physical experience of being uh touched by that feather and then they someone took a knife 
I mean, the 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 researchers they took a knife and actually um, stabbed the 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 dummy in the belly, and many of the people who 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 looked down on themselves and identified with the body of the dummy felt pain. So I thought that was a really interesting experience because it shows that our body automatically connects to some physical basis, and it doesn't necessarily have to be our the body we're connected with now. So of course I'm not saying it's the same. I'm not saying we're having we can just think oh I have a body of a dummy and and then that becomes true. But I'm I just want to uh, indicate that our identity our identif identification with this body uh, a huge part of it is on a psychological basis. It's mine, it's me, it's mine. And so that the reason we feel pain is very much with that identification. And for those practitioners who realized emptiness directly, it is said that there, the experience of pain is totally different. There's no identification. There's no identification with this body as being like intrinsically mine. And the experience of pain, there's definitely a sensation, but not the sensation of extreme pain, etc. In the case of, for instance, being injured. So it shows very much that we identify with this body, we want to protect it, but it was, all has to do with our misapprehension of reality to some degree, which is why it makes sense that we exchange ourselves with others, that we can loosen this holding on to this is my body, this is my mind. We can actually loosen that because it's based on a wrong view. So, of course, conventionally, it is my body, it is my mind. But to have a sense that others' minds and bodies, okay, so conventionally, they're not mine, but we're not totally disconnected the way it feels to us. And in fact, since our happiness is totally dependent on others, it doesn't make sense in any way to 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 hold on to my own happiness, my own physical and verbal physical and mental uh, well-being to be more important than that of others. So I think it's really important to become more familiar with that on a logical basis. My mind, my body. Well, on a conventional level, yes, but the way it appears to us as being intrinsically, me being over here and everyone else over there, that kind of distance, the way it appears to our mind is just a delusion. And understanding that and reflecting on that again and again. And here, like I said, modern psychology, modern modern science can very much help us that this is just in our mind. And so once we get a better understanding of that and understand, of course, the disadvantage of cherishing ourselves to such a extreme degree that causes us a lot of suffering, well, then it becomes much easier to actually exchange ourselves for others to think of i not just as this mind and body but embrace others as well as part of i which then leads to this natural tendency to not just look after our own well-being and happiness but that of others as well so as i mentioned last time maybe do this exercise like just visualize start labeling i when you see another person I mentioned that one of my teachers, Gestrup de Besson, once uh, gave a teaching on that where he actually instructed us um, in that way, saying, just visualize, say, I, 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 when you see this person in the supermarket. I mean, just verbally or mental, well, it's really mental, it's not verbally, <laughs> don't say that verbally, don't say it loud, but if you're, for instance, in the queue in the supermarket and this other person is trying to get, you know, to, 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 go before you and 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 be done before you instead of going oh this other person so annoying oh i get to finish a little earlier and kind of just label i on the other person and our mind automatically because we're so used to i i i i'm so important i'm more important etc so there's a natural tendency to cherish that person more and of course we know in the back of our mind this is not me but just to to Try it out to think of this other person, I, I. And of course, in other situations as well, in our inter interaction with other people, 
This is I. <coughs> this person is I. Their, their friends and their family is mine. And because of, like I, like I just said, our habitual tendency of cherishing I, there's more of a likelihood, it's more likely that we cherish the other person. And it's just a matter of growing accustomed to it, to growing attached. So our mind psychologically works on habituation. I mean, everything we do is based on habituation. That's the beauty of our mind. We can reprogram our mind. We can, well, that's just another way of saying start new habits, uh, develop m new habits. And this habit of constantly cherishing ourselves is so harmful and so painful. And in that way, to, to today conclude this meditation, go through each point, make it, make some time for each point. Disadvantages of self-centeredness, advantages of cherishing others. And then the fact that they're actually equal. Just as I'm important to myself, other sentient beings are equally important. On a conventional level, we've gone through that. And on an ultimate level, anyway, I mean, just as I'm merely labeled, I, I'm labeled I, I, I on the basis of this mind, this body, but in particular, this mind. Well, others label the same, I, I, I on their basis. And so from their perspective, they are I. So it's not that unrealistic to think of the other person in the supermarket as I, because they are I in relation to their own mind. It's just not in relation to my mind. Um, and so in that way, to understand that we think of others just from the perspective of this mind, but in and of themselves, they're neither I nor others. It's just labeled. So to consider all that, so equal on a conventional level, equal on an ultimate level, the way I just uh, said, and then to exchange. Think of, well, if not, I is kind of a little weird to think of others as I, but at least, well, we like we, there's no difference. And of course, we can all do that. Parents definitely know what I'm talking about. Because for parents, there's this sense, well, they're children. It's, they're like an extension of themselves. They're children being an extension of themselves. And so it makes a lot more sense that what is I includes, I don't know how many children. I mean, if you have five children, well, then the I has expanded to these five children. And it's possible for many parents to put their own happiness on hold and put the happiness of their, their children. I mean, most parents, I'd say, uh, put the happiness of their children before themselves. So it's totally possible. And it's something that grows with every child. I mean, I've said it on, on many occasions. It's not like your love is divided. 100% love divided into five children. So you only have 20% of love for each child. No, it expands. Your care and love and compassion, it expands. And so if it can expand towards five people, five children in this case, while well, it can expand actually towards all sentient beings, it shows our mind can totally familiarize with that. And why should I do it? I mean, why should I do this? It sounds like a lot of work and difficult, but it's so rewarding. It's so rewarding. This happiness we're constantly looking for. And we find to a certain degree in, in maybe buying something new or be hanging out with friends, but it's so short-lived and not a real deep happiness that can be found in exactly that practice. So what we're looking for is a lasting and deeper inner happiness. And well, we can only find out whether we can find that kind of happiness if we practice this. So anyway, having said all this, so exchanging self and others in the way of not actually becoming the other person, that's not what's meant with that, but our focus of I, 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 my happiness being so important, that is exchanged. And so really to... Make it a point throughout this week in every situation that you can. Of course, if you do the meditation, this becomes much easier uh, to do in, in our daily interaction with other people. But to really make a point of may that person be happy in the, in the sense of having that sincere wish 
in the same way as we have it towards ourselves. So that same cherishing that we experience for ourselves to have it for others and to practice, to, 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 to really practice with our loved ones, with people around us, with the people we may not like to the best of our ability. Okay. And then, of course, giving our happiness and taking the suffering of others here in the form of Donglen. That is a, a beautiful way to train our mind. Uh, we, of course, we're not literally taking on this suffering. We're not literally giving our happiness, but we're training our mind to actually go out there and 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 help beings. So, to of course, that's also part of it in our daily life. It doesn't have to be finding a cure to cancer or I don't know something world moving little things to just lend our ear to be there for others, to listen to their problems. I mean, just listening to others without necessarily the 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 the, the wish, or not just the wish, but that obsession with, I have to talk about myself. No, no, just listening to others, giving our times in that way. It doesn't have to be something major, but in every little situation, to try as much as we can to focus on the well-being of others. And by doing that, we're focusing on our own well-being. I mean, indirectly, because that is so healthy for our own mind, for our own body. But of course, we can only find out if we make an extra effort and see how it goes. But I'm not saying sacrificing yourself and giving up your own happiness. It's not about that. It's not some kind of self-sacrifice, but rather putting others before self. Okay. Or maybe... Not even going to that extreme, but considering others as equally important. All right. So let's try this for this coming week. And um, maybe questions come up, maybe doubts come up, and you're welcome to share them. Uh, I've heard that Jimmy has asked a question, but due to the circumstances right now, um, I haven't got the question yet, but I'll answer it next time. So it's still all... Uh, because of the the situation right now. Um, So things take a little longer, but next week I'll answer it. I hope that's okay. Um, And then to go back to the text itself. Um, The seven-point mind training that we're reading through at this point. So the seven points, as we've heard, The basis, of course, is important. And then the main practice really is described in the second point, which is the practice of bodhicitta. That is the essence of what's called mind training. And as we know, there are two types of bodhicittas, conventional and ultimate. Conventional, well, that refers to bodhicitta itself. It can be called, well, here's called awakening mind because in Tibetan there are two words. Two words for bodhicitta. One word literally translates, well, in Sanskrit, it's bodhicitta, or in English, it's the mind of enlightenment. Changchu sem. So changchu sem. Changchu means enlightenment, sem means mind. Okay, so enlightenment mind or mind of enlightenment. The other word is semke. Semke. Um, has a connotation of mind again. Sem means mind. And then ge kind of means to uh, to grow, to generate, or loosely translated awaken. So to awakening, to go through this process of generating the mind, of awakening the mind, of kind of almost like expanding the mind, which is another word. Semke is another word for bodhicitta. Okay. That is conventional bodhicitta or bodhicitta usually, well, when we talk of bodhicitta, that's what we mean, conventional bodhicitta. And we've heard, of course, the main obstacle we face towards generating that amazing, precious mind uh, is the single source, our self-centeredness, to be aware of that, and I've discussed it to some degree. Then the next point is to contemplate the great kindness of others. Again, very challenging, very difficult, but uh, very rewarding at the same time. And of course, we need to start where we are and do as much as we can. Um, 
And then, well, the next point that is made here is to train in giving and taking, alternately. Okay, so we've heard last time we did some of the meditation. We've also heard before we can actually do this um, in the most effective way, we may want to start with ourselves because we're used to that. And, of course, even though there's the self-centered attitude we need to be careful of, but well, we need to work with it, which means initially we just start with ourselves. That's okay. And to visualize breathing, uh, breathing in, taking all our breathing in all good qualities we already have on a potential level, but manifestly breathing them in so that they can become manifest, they can uh, become active, and breathing out particular problem we have a hard time with that just doesn't seem to go away etc so visualizing ourselves to take away our to take our own suffering which of course okay at this point is just visualizing it but eventually through the transformation of our mind not only do we focus on the benefit of other sentient beings uh, and and work towards benefiting them etc we very much benefit ourselves in fact generating compassion it benefits mainly ourselves it's kind of like the side effect if you like although at some point when we practice love and compassion we couldn't care less what benefit we reap ourselves but that's just this, this the kind of side effect that's how it, it, it works these kind of minds really benefit us so much so anyway, starting off the Donglen meditation, just focusing on us on ourselves to get familiar, become familiar with the meditation. So there's no harm in doing that. Of course, best is to have the motivation to benefit others. So for the benefit of others, I'm visualizing, I visualize I'm taking on this, I'm I'm breathing in this problem that I have, um, and it disappears in my heart in the form of, well, it destroys my self-centeredness, that problem, it, I, I breathe it in in the form of smoke, for instance, or dark light. And then as I breathe out, I breathe out all my potential qualities in the form of manifest active qualities that now benefit myself and, and, and help me to generate even greater qualities and so forth. So we can start off with this. And then we focus on others. But we may just start with one person, someone we deeply care for. So we focus on that person. And then we include more, maybe two people, maybe a third person, maybe someone we really don't like, someone we have a personal problem with, maybe take them. So we experiment with it a little bit. And, and as our as our determination grows, our courage grows, a sense of deep satisfaction, even though it's just visualized, but still uh, hopefully giving us deeper courage and so forth, um, then we, we may choose to take more and more sentient beings, to include more and more until we reach the point of all sentient beings. So, as I said last time, it has incredible benefits and a lot of great practitioners have attained high realizations mainly based on that practice. So it's kind of the culmination of equalizing and ex exchanging self and others, self with others. It's also just good for breathing because, I mean, nowadays we're stressed out and as a natural tendency because of the stress we experience we don't breathe deep enough so with this meditation we definitely take deeper breath because you want to visualize as much as you can so you take a deeper and longer breath and again as i mentioned last time to try and 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 practice this as often as you can so many situations when our mind is pretty much on auto autopilot and we can easily practice this okay Anyway, let's move on to the next point that's made here. Okay, so what does it say here? It says, uh, it, so this is the first part of the instruction. First of all, let's be, be clear. Again, I, as I mentioned before, this should be practical. So how is this practical? Well, practical in our day-to-day -day, day -day life, when things go well, when there's a problem, let's understand 
self-centeredness is very much a part of this, part of the problem. So let's not underestimate it. Let's not suppress it and just be aware of it and make sure that it doesn't take over our lives too much. Then, of course, focusing on the kindness of others to the greatest, I mean, to whichever degree we can, and to engage in this practice of giving and taking, the way I just spoke about it. And then the text continues. So what else should we do? It says here, there are three objects, three poisons, and three roots of virtue. So what are these three objects? The three objects are three different type of people. Those we find pleasant, those we find unpleasant, and everyone else we don't care about. So there are three types of living beings, I should say. That also includes uh, animals, any type of, of living being. But of course, in our day-to-day -day kind of interaction, it's mainly humans. Humans we attach to, humans we have aversion towards, and humans we're totally indifferent towards. So there are these three types of humans. I spoke about how we have this natural tendency to categorize other beings in these three categories. And that categorization, of course, is an innate process that is difficult to overcome. But what we can do at this point is not to follow it, is to not allow for this to go on, but to be aware of not giving in this idea of like, I like this person and the rest I don't care or I I, I don't want to be around. So to be aware of that, uh, to be mindful of it and to apply the appropriate antidotes. So here it's saying, there's these three objects, these three living beings, and there are three poisons that arise in relation to these. So three mental poisons, three afflictions, aversion towards those we find unpleasant, uh, attachment towards those we find pleasant, and then ignorance, we just couldn't care less. We totally ignore them. We're indifferent towards everyone else. So these three poisons are uh, increased or they're they're strengthened based on the attitude we have towards other sentient beings, dividing them in these three ways. And there are three roots of virtue. The three roots of virtue that the commentaries describe are the sincere wish for these three beings, three types of beings, the, the ones we find pleasant, unpleasant, and the ones we don't care about, to be free from these, these three poisons. So in this case, of course, we wish ourselves to be free from them as well. But to have that sincere aspiration, may they be free from these three poisons. Because just as we are afflicted by them, as they poison our mind and our body, they poison our mind and body. I mean, I, th I think it's it's really interesting in the West now, which is very nice. It's a, it's a very good um, movement, if you like, the health movement that we are so concerned about the food we eat, which is very sensible. I mean, we have to be concerned. There are a lot of chemicals in the food. It's important to avoid certain poisons in the water, in the veggies we buy, in the meat and so forth, whatever we eat. So we're very aware of avoiding these physical poisons. So the same concern we have for avoiding physical poisons is to avoid these mental poisons. Because they poison us as well. So to be aware of their poisonous effect on our, on our well-being. And so in the same way as we suffer from them and should be aware, it is such a deep expression of care for other sentient beings. As part of the first step to benefit them to overcome these three poisons to wish sincerely for them to be free from all roots, from all three poisons, from all poisons and not just the three, but all any type of poison. So even if we have a hard time with someone, we dislike certain people, we maybe even hate some people, but we hate them because of these three poisons. I mean, it's very much we see faults in them that sometimes they're exaggerated, but many times, of course, there is something to that. They're they're, they're controlled by their, their aversion, by their hatred, by their attachment, and so forth. So then to sincerely wish, may they be free from those. May they be free from these three poisons. So that wish 
for all these three objects, these three beings, to be three from the three from the three poisons is described as the three roots of virtue. Okay, so to make a point, in of course, as part we can bring it together with giving and taking. So for sentient beings, not just to be free from suffering, but most importantly, and of course the three poisons are a type of suffering, to be free from the causes of suffering or to be free from suffering in the form of the three poisons. It's just a different way of saying it. So we should practice these three roots of virtue. Then everything that's been said so far is mainly focused on the meditation session. But that doesn't mean we can't meditate in the supermarket queue and in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the yeah while standing in, in in the queue in the supermarket while being in a traffic jam while waiting for this that and the other while brushing our teeth while on the toilet we can of course make that our meditation session so there's no excuse i don't have time to meditate okay maybe we don't have time to sit down for a half an hour uh, maybe we don't have a quiet place to be able to meditate there are so many opportunities, so many, when we're just alone with our own thoughts and usually we daydream. Well, a little bit of daydreaming is okay, of course. We need to relax and just sometimes allow our mind to 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 just take its course. But also take these opportunities and become accustomed to to meditating. Like I said, in, in our daily life. So to make that, to, 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 to generate that or to... to develop that kind of uh, habit. And then it's the instruction in the post-meditation session. Now here, of course, it's a little difficult, like when is the post-meditation session? Um, I guess, strictly speaking, this refers to actually the time when we're not in an official session. Uh, so, of course, best is if we can make some time, at least half an hour in the morning, another half an hour in the evening. That's just one hour maybe just cut down on our TV time, um, watch a little bit less TV or whatever. So the instruction in the, so to making that time and then the instruction in the post-meditation session is in short, to be mindful of this practice in all actions by try, training ourselves through words. What does that mean, through words? Okay, now here the commentaries are very specific these words are kind of sentences that we speak in our mind. For instance, like when you're not really in the mood to now meditate, I mean, it takes some effort, you know, to, to visualize I'm taking all the suffering of other sentient beings. I give all my happiness. So in that way to meditate on Donglen or to reflect on their positive qualities or whatever we are reflecting on in the context of bodhicitta, to just in our mind repeat certain words. So a mantra, of course, would also be okay. But if I say om mani pema hum, it doesn't suggest to me necessarily compassion. If it does, okay, I can use it, compassion. But also sentences such as, May all their suffering disappear. May all their three poisons. And just repeat it like a mantra. May, may, may they be free from all poisons. May they be free from all ignorance. May they have love. Just repeat it in your mind. May all their suffering ripen on me. And may all my happiness uh, ripen on them. Uh, so to use these, these words, to use these sentences basically um, like a mantra. So that's one way to be mindful of the practice that we do in the meditation meditation session session. And again, whether it's in the supermarket, whether it's on our meditation cushion or in some other situation during Donglen, for instance, and then to be mindful of this practice in all actions and repeating these words in our mind. So in Buddhism, there are a lot of methods, there are a lot of tools to staying mindful. So this is one tool by repeating internally, by not, of course, loudly. You don't want to loudly repeat this. Well, if you're on your own, you could, but just mentally. And it helps our mind to stay mindful and not to be carried off in all kinds of directions. All right. So those are the instructions given here in terms of the conventional awakening mind. All right. So 
this is a little separate from this part here, this part I've explained before uh, or last time, definitely extensively. And here, what is the instruction? Well, to focus on the three objects, the three poisons, and use those three by way of generating the three roots of virtue. To wish for all sentient beings, pleasant, unpleasant, and, the, and, and everyone else we're indifferent towards, to be free from the three poisons uh, as part of our actual meditation. And then when we're out of this meditation, meditation session, out of this focus kind of practice, to keep to be mindful of this practice in all actions by training ourselves through words. To certain words that inspire us, even if it's, well, it, like a, a verse we may uh, memorize so for as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, may also remain and remove the suffering of sentient beings. As an example, anything that inspires you and repeat it in your mind. And you may change. I mean, if you get bored of one, one verse or one sentence then use other ones all right so that is what geshe chekova says about training in the conventional awaking mind but we also need to train ourselves in ultimate bodhicitta or the ultimate awakening mind so here it says when stability is attained so on the basis of the practice as just described then teach the secret or we should receive the secret teachings. It's not like saying we should go out and teach the secret, but then the secret should be taught, basically. So we should, in other words, make ourselves, familiarize ourselves with emptiness, the ultimate reality. And that is so difficult. First of all, difficult to explain, but even more difficult to understand. But we need baby steps in the beginning. Everyone started with little baby steps. And just because it's difficult, we shouldn't ignore it. So this is also part of this practice. And we can do it in a gentle way. So here it says, regard all phenomena as dreamlike. I think the dream example is so powerful. I mean, sometimes we share with friends like dreams we had. It's so interesting uh, it's so interesting how we can have these very deep emotions in our dreams, although what triggered those emotions wasn't there. So the dream example is, is very potent in the sense that things appear to be so concrete and so real. And in, in actuality, they don't exist that way. And so they trigger all these emotions, but based on phenomena appearing in a way in which they don't exist. And so to really understand emptiness, like I said, is extremely difficult. But in the meantime, to just train our mind, okay, it seems a lot more concrete than it actually is, to remind ourselves. And I think impermanence is also really powerful in this context, reminding ourselves of the fact that everything is constantly changing. Everything is in a constant flux. So the sense of something being there, very concrete, a concrete mind, a concrete body, it's just not there. How could it be concrete when everything is constantly changing? So our mind latches onto not just inherent existence, but based on that sense there's something concrete and substantial over there, it grasps at permanence. And impermanence is slightly easier. It's easier to understand it. But we shouldn't separate them. So dreamlike, phenomena are dreamlike, but at the same time, constantly changing. So they're always changing, changing, changing. So this the phenomena, the world around us is constantly changing. Nothing remains the same. So from moment to moment and to, to move along with this change, uh, to, to remind ourselves, not just of death, not just of the changes that are obvious. That's not enough. Of course, relationships change, seasons change, political situations, they all change the environment, yes, but even on a subtler level, to, to meditate on that time and again, to remind ourselves of that subtle change, constant change. 
that helps already very much in undoing our habitual, our mental habit of latching onto things. It's like this, it's like that. It's just something came to mind this afternoon. Um, I, I was reminded in the context of impermanence, the context of labeling and having labeled ourselves as this, that, and the other, and believing that to be the case. We, I talked about this some month ago. I gave a course on the Heart Sutra in Tushita. And actually, just as it happened to be an Israeli girl um, in that was in the group, and she asked me a question. She said, she, she told me she had been abused some years ago. She talked about having been abused. And she said, am I a, a victim? Am I a victim or not of abuse? And so I know this whole, I mean, I know I don't know really, but I've heard time and again this sense of identifying with being a victim and feeling like you're paralyzed. And, and this it's, it's like this whole heaviness that goes along with feeling I'm a victim. So for some people, it's easier. For some people, it's harder. But as she asked me this question, so I, I, I had to admit, I never really thought about this. Like someone who has been a victim of abuse, are they? And so in the end, I came to the conclusion in that moment when she was abused, we apply the term victim. But conventionally, I mean, this is a convention we use. Someone, let's say, attacks me. I'm in a you know, dark alley. Someone attacks me uh, and abuses me. In that moment, yes, we apply the term victim. But when the situation is over, it's done with, well, now, right, like, like right now, let's say let this happened to me yesterday. Am I a victim right now? No. Now it's not happening to me. So yesterday, yes, I, I was a victim. But the thing is, we very much identify with each moment in the past. But right now I'm not, which means I'm not caught in that victimhood. I can do something. I can go out and possibly make sure this person gets caught and disciplined and so forth. So I'm not that paralyzed person. I was in that moment, but not, and now I'm not. So it's this tendency we have, we use labels, forget that this is a label we've used, have a sense I have this victimhood within me and carry it inside me. <laughs> What we're, it, it can't be found. It has been labeled on that situation. But that doesn't make me a paralyzed kind of, oh, my victimhood for all my, I can never. No, it's, that's not realistic. And as I went through talking about this in this course, I was also reminded of when we talk about karma, for instance, it's so easily misunderstood. When we talk about karma, so... It's very difficult initially. Um, initially, when we when something happens to us, and then we hear karma, and it's like, well, but I'm not a bad person. I, I I haven't done anything, and then I'm like, oh, I deserve this because it's my karma. Total misunderstanding, because who we are right now is very different to the person who accumulated, who, who did an action in the past, even if it's like last lifetime or, you know, maybe like thousands of lifetimes, who knows? That's not me right now. So my mind and my body are very different to the person who, I don't know, if I accumulated a karma to be hit over the head or, I don't know, to have something stolen from me, Take that, let's take that example. All right. So this mental continuum existed in a very different way. I mean, even when I was a teenager, I'm not the same person. I refuse to think I'm the same person, <laughs> this, this confused teenager. I'm still pretty confused, but I'm not that 13-year-old being totally. So I don't identify with that person. So whatever this person did, 13, 14, 15, and so forth, I don't identify with it right now. And going further back, Anything that happened in the past, that's not me. But there's a mental continuum that continued on. So there's no sense of like, of like oh, I'm a bad person. No, it just happened. Unfortunately, I haven't purified it yet. It's still there. And if it happens to me, okay. So at least that part of the karma 
has manifested and it cannot manifest again in that same way unless I create, of course, or unless I've created other karmas. I don't know. But the point I'm trying to make is not only do we have a deep sense of our identity being somehow intrinsic in us, but we also hold on to who we were in the past, the labels we used in the past, and hold on to them as that being ourselves right now, which is far from the truth. If moment by moment we change, we're not the same person. There are similarities, but they're not the same. Of course, we could be, we have certain habitual tendencies. So if I got angry yesterday, I get angry again today. But the person who got angry yesterday is not the same as today. There's just, there's similarity, but it's not identical. And I think we need to remind ourselves time and again of this, especially when it comes to our sense of identity, impermanence, and of course the fact that any anything that we consider to be part of our I, I, an identity is labeled, is labeled, of course, on the basis of labeling, but it doesn't exist as concrete as our mind wants us to believe or as our mind or as it appears to our mind, let's put it that way. So anyway, so to regard all phenomena as dreamlike, in that sense, not as concrete, not as unchanging as it seems, to really remind ourselves of that to the best of our ability. Examine the nature of the unborn awareness, even our mind. So here it refers to phenomena other than the mind, the objects that we perceive with our mind, ourselves, our environment, that doesn't exist as concrete as it seems. But even our mind itself, the one that is a constant narrator, the one that is constantly aware of this, that, and the other, also doesn't exist as concrete in, the, in that concrete way in which it appears to ourselves. And even the antidotes, the remedy, so the, 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 the antidote, the wisdom, understanding, reality, which grows, which, which needs to develop. It's not there right from the beginning, but it slowly deepens as we, well, reflect on emptiness, as we reflect on the Dharma and, and put it into practice as much as we can. Even these remedies don't exist in and of themselves. So here it says freed in its own place. Another way to translate this could be freed, are free in terms of their natural state. So the Tibetan word here allows for different types of translations. I chose Geshe Thupten Jimba's translation here. Um, but there's another way of, of translating that. As I said, it can also mean um, in its natural state. Let me just check it out. Oh, yeah. So to, to, to let it go, you could also translate it as allow, let it go in its own natural state or, 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 uh, allow for it to be in its own natural state. In other words, the remedy to become aware that its natural state is that of lacking this concrete existence that we that our mind uh, holds on to. Instead, place your mind on the basis of all, the actual path, which here the basis of all is that is ultimate bodhicitta, the mind that experiences, the lack of inherent existence of all phenomena. So place your mind on that, focus on that. In other words here, so again, when we, as part of our practice of bodhicitta, it includes, of course, conventional bodhicitta, as explained earlier, based on love, compassion, and so forth, but it's also based on ultimate bodhicitta. So even though our main focus as part of this class as well for the time being is love and compassion, but we shouldn't throw out emptiness. We shouldn't ignore that as well. To, to a certain degree, make it a point, phenomena are like dreams, the things around us. Our own mind is like a dream. It's not as, as substantial as it appears. And even the antidotes, the remedies that, that we're working towards, bodhicitta, conventional, ultimate, all these positive states of mind, again, don't hold on to them. Release them into their natural state. They're freed in its own place or they're 
they, in other words, don't hold on to their inherent existence, but realize in their own place, from their point of view of their natural state, they're free from that inherent existence. And that's focus base. Let's focus our mind on ultimate bodhicitta, even though we don't have ultimate bodhicitta yet, but generate focus on that mind by way of its main object, which is emptiness, right? And even maybe just visualize that we're experiencing that lack of inherent existence, even if just nothingness appears. But to, to habituate our mind to kind of move away from that holding on some onto some concreteness. So that's what we should do as part of our meditation session. And there's this beautiful practice as holiness, um, as holiness oftentimes teaches, bring it, unifying those two, conventional and ultimate bodhicitta, in the form of um, this uh, yoga, this tamjanyanjur, um, tamjanyanjur. Uh, um, I forget now the Sanskrit word for it. Um, anyway, never mind. It's this practice. It's this practice Sava where. Yoga say, Sava say yoga again. Sava right, yoga that, yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. That's it. So you visualize, first of all, you generate conventional bodhicitta for all sentient beings. And then you visualize that this mind of bodhicitta. So you actually generate bodhicitta and you visualize it at your heart in the form of a a white moon disk that's lying at your heart. And then you generate ultimate bodhicitta. You visualize that all these sentient beings, or you focus on the fact that they are constantly changing. There's nothing concrete about them. They're merely labeled. And to the best of your ability, you focus on that and visualize that this mind that now experiences lack of inherent existence of all sentient beings, of all phenomena, arises in the form of a white vajra standing on top of the white moon disk. And just visualize that these two minds are unified at your heart. This is a very powerful practice. And in the, uh, in the for the last few years, this homeless has very much emphasized that. So to just visualize that these two, if, if, if the moon disk and the vajra, if they don't appear clearly, it doesn't matter, but just to have a sense of these two being unified at your heart. Geshema, I'm, Geshema, I'm sorry. I forget <laughs> what is moon disk. Oh, a moon disk. Oh, yeah, that's sorry. really weird. <laughs> the moon disk. It's like a moon. Visualize the moon as a two-dimensional object, like a disk, like almost like a, like think of a coin a flat coin, but it's like the moon. It's like this white, pure object, right? So it's not really the moon because that's spherical. It's a it's a spherical object. But as part of, a, well, especially Buddhist tantric practice of very visualized objects, uh, you visualize this disc, this round, flat object, uh, which symbolizes the moon, which symbolizes purity, right? So just, don't think of it as a moon disk, maybe just as a white disk. Okay, great. Anyway, time is almost up. So in that way, oh, and then the last, the last sentence, the last sentence is, and then during your, when you arise from that kind of meditation, um, then be like a, a conjurer of illusions. So remind yourself, even though, you, when you when you rise from that kind of meditation on emptiness, however short, even if it's just five minutes, that's great. That's much better than not doing anything. So then, think like you're like a magician, like like a magician when you like a like if, if, if you're, it's just a it's just an um, example an analogy. Like a magician conjures up lots of illusory objects. You know this is not true. You know this is not actually. I don't know whatever appears. So you're aware that this is just, it's just a trick. It's just an optical illusion. So be like such a magician who knows it's an optical illusion. Look at the world as uh, like being like optical illusions. All right. So that's the last part of the um, practice of ultimate bodhicitta. Now, maybe you have time for one question before they do the meditation. There's any question. 
that you spontaneously want to ask. Go ahead, if you want to. No? All right. I can try. Oh, do I the train? Do you hear me more? Oh, hi, you're in the train. That's nice. Hi. Uh, I just didn't get the moon is supposed to be the compassion and the body mm -hmm. or Yes. Well, no, actually... The moon disk, first, when you generate conventional bodhicitta, it's the mind itself, right? So you generate in your own continuum, generate bodhicitta. Just as we know, bodhicitta based on love and compassion. And then you focus on that mind, your own bodhicitta, and visualize that that mind now transforms into a moon disk, into a flat, into well, a moon disk that lies at your heart like this not standing up like not like this but like that like a, it, it serves as a basis yeah yeah exactly exactly so visualize that at your heart so in that sense because of this visualization in your heart you maintain that conventional mind it's there right you visualize it's at your heart so conventional bodhicitta doesn't leave you Although, it, strictly speaking, of course, now with that visualization, it's not really active, but there's a sense it's still there. And then, having focused on all sentient beings, um, now, based on them having generated the wish to become enlightened for all sentient beings, and that having become the moon disk at your heart, you now focus on all sentient beings and meditate on their emptiness. The fact that they lack inherent existence, that they don't exist inherently and so forth. And then that mind that focuses on, you do, you just, you fake it. Never mind. It's not like a real understanding of emptiness, but it doesn't matter. So to the best degree, you focus on emptiness. And then your mind of ultimate bodhicitta, you think you, you visualize it transforms into a vajra, a white vajra that's standing now on that moon disk in union at your heart and so in that way through this visualization you keep those two minds close to you right and then remind yourself time and again if you can oh those two at my heart and on many occasions as wholeness has suggested to do this early in the morning right so this these days always says i start my day with uh, bodhicitta and emptiness which is another way of saying I do this practice of conventional and ultimate bodhicitta, bringing the two together, combining the two, right? It's a beautiful, beautiful practice. Um, and so this is a, a nice way to practice also what's part of the seven-point mind training. All right? Okay, great. Now let's do some meditation on exactly that. Let's try and, and do this. Although it's part of the tantric practice, it can also be done in a sutric context. So maybe we just do this practice briefly together, combining combining conventional and ultimate bodhicitta. And for that, for that, let's do some breathing meditation again. Just to focus the mind. Keep the mind in the present. Now let's generate, first of all, great compassion that is an affectionate mind 
this focus that is focused on all sentient beings and that wishes from the depth of our heart that they're free from all their unwanted experiences and most importantly that they're free from the three poisons aversion, attachment and ignorance Together with you, aspiration, may I be able, may I find a way to protect each and every sentient being from all the sufferings and the three poisons that cause these sufferings. So having generated that deep affectionate love, affectionate mind that has great compassion let's now generate bodhicitta conventional bodhicitta uh, based on our aspiration to protect sentient beings from suffering and its causes, wishes to become enlightened to be able to fulfill the aspiration that is great compassion. thinking that may I become a fully enlightened Buddha so that I'd be able in the most effective way to free all sentient beings from the three poisons and all other afflictions and in that way from all sufferings. So try to aspire towards that state of enlightenment on the basis of deep compassion and love for all sentient beings try to generate that mind from the depth of your heart focused on all sentient beings. Without exception.
And then visualize that, that mind, that conventional bodhicitta. takes on the form of a pure and radiant moon disk. That lies at the that lies at your heart or the center of your chest. where it remains as a stable basis. And then focus once again on all sentient beings, including yourself. And the fact that they're all changing constantly. Their minds, their bodies, Never the same from moment to moment. And on a deeper level, the fact that there appears very concrete and substantial they are merely labeled and when we search for anything concrete and substantial. It cannot be found. The body consists of endless atoms which are arranged in a certain way are labeled body that appears permanent and independently existent. But it's just labeled. And then there's awareness, the experiencing entity we call a mind. It 
again, consisting of endless different moments of conscious awareness. which we then label mind. That when then taken apart, into different moments of awareness, cannot be found to exist in any concrete and independent way. My body, your body, my awareness, your awareness. Again, they're merely labeled. Even the mind that is meditating right now. is merely designated, labeled by the mind. And so now the mind itself focuses on the emptiness of all phenomena. Visualize that it takes on the form of a white, pure and radiant Vajra. Standing on top of the white moon disk. that is conventional bodhicitta and that is located at your heart. And in that way, unifying those two minds, conventional and ultimate bodhicitta, at your heart. And now to conclude this meditation, take a moment to single-pointedly just focus on the two minds that have risen in your mental continuum. That are located at your heart. And then finally, let's dedicate whatever positive potential we've accumulated today towards, of course, our own future awakening so that we'll be able to 
develop these two minds of bodhicitta to eventually purify our mind and body to become fully enlightened beings, fully enlightened Buddhas for the benefit of each and every sentient being. And in the meantime, may our positive potential become a cause for our great spiritual masters, like His Holiness the Dalai Lama and all other realized masters, to have a very long and healthy life so that they can continue to teach us through their words and their examples. And lastly, may our positive potential have a positive effect on all other sentient beings right here and right now. May it help everyone experiencing war and conflict to overcome their three poisons and find sincere love and compassions in their heart and in that way deep inner peace and for those of you who know venerable max or tupting gillick from australia who has been a monk for, I think, almost 30 years. He passed away yesterday in Delhi. So let's also dedicate towards him his, well, may he have a positive part of state and a positive rebirth. And so based on that thought, let's recite the a dedication prayer. Through the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chenrezig, Denzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the precious Bodhi mind, not yet born, arise and grow. May that born have no, de no decline, but increase forevermore. Thank you very much. Um, just quickly, I mentioned Venerable Max. I forgot to mention him earlier. So many of you know him, I think. Um, yeah, he's been a monk. He was actually born in Austria. Then he moved to Australia when he was very little. But um, I think both his parents are Jewish, and he served in the Israeli army. I think he uh, he was a, an, an Israeli soldier. He knows Hebrew, or he knew Hebrew to some degree. I could uh, talk to Israelis here in Dharamsala. As I said, he was a monk for, I think, 50 years. And yesterday, unfortunately, he collapsed in Delhi and shortly afterwards passed away. He was 80 years old. Anyway, okay. So that's it for today. Please be safe and I'll see you again next week. Take good care and shalom. Thank you, Gesha. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, dear friend. Thank you to Six o'clock. Thank you very oh. much. Uh, oh, yes. What time are we going to meet next week? It will be six o'clock as well time next time. Yes. Thank you Great. very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you.